connecting the dots. This is the name of the panel. And lines connecting dots is actually how a grid looks like when you see it on a map. So very simple in some way. But I think we understand today how complex is the task of building and managing a network and a grid in today's energy system and how it will be even more complex in the future one. So I'm very pleased to be here today and engage in a discussion with our speakers in order to understand how to be more effective in uh, performing this task. Uh, in previous sessions today, we have heard how to decarbonize our energy system and how uh, actually also to secure supply, but from a generation perspective. But this will have very limited benefits if we don't modernize our grid, making them more smarter and more flexible. And this, as we heard, must happen now and must also be very fast. And so how we can make this happen? So building a smarter and a more flexible grid. Of course, digitization could play a very key role in this. So let me welcome on stage Sabine Erlingagen, CEO of Grid Software, that will give us an overview on how, what it means to digitize the energy grids. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, I think throughout the day we've been all aware more keenly than ever we live in unprecedented times. And I tried to put that into a few numbers. It's about the electrification of everything. And I just took a couple of numbers here to make that point again, because it was nicely shown throughout the day. We are talking about a 7x growth in distributed energy resources. That's sevenfold what we see today, just in the next seven years. And quite honestly, I believe that these numbers are even underestimated. If I look into Estonia, they're talking 15x in a matter of three years. That comes with an increase of electrical vehicle charging stations of 18x. That's what the World Economic Forum tells us. And from 3 million new heat pumps that we saw last year to 50 million more in the matter of the next seven years. Those numbers are mind-boggling. And I think in the panel before, they said, this is coming much faster than we ever thought. Because every year I ge get on stage, the predictions just know one direction. They go upwards. And they have the transition to a decentralized world is happening faster than we ever thought. So two or three years ago, I thought the number that you saw on the uh, right-hand side here was 2x of electricity consumption until 2050. We are at 3x. That means 3x the grid capacity, and that's why we are here. So the challenges are increasing. And if I put that into newspaper articles, I could have put so many more on here. Because what we lack is grid capacity. And we lack it fast. So if you look at the grid of Estonia, actually m many parts of the grid can't take new connection requests for any DRs anymore. Or I just learned that in Hungary, actually, there's a ban for connecting anything new in the, to the grid. Or if you go to the Netherlands, similar uh, story. Large part of the grid just can't take it anymore. So those numbers that we've seen are short term. They're the next seven years. No big infrastructure pro project will do that trick in seven years. So how on earth do we bring up the grid capacity with the necessary speed. It's all about speed that we are solving for. If those, connect, those predictions continue to go upwards, and if we see that somebody called it an avalanche of DERs wanting to get access to the grid. So we're solving for speed. And I think everybody in this room, at least, would agree that the low voltage grids are at the center of that energy transition, because that's where most of the connections are coming in. 
Or if you don't want to believe my words, I took a quote from uh, Deloitte to put it nicely. Power distribution grids are a crucial element in the European energy transition because they serve as the basis for electrification and capacity expansion, acting as connection point for renewable plants and helping enable flexibility and demand side management. Yet the distribution grids and especially the low voltage grids are the ones that are least managed. So if we're solving for speed and if we want to gain more grid capacity, what is the fastest possible way to do that? And I would argue that we need to squeeze more out of the existing grid. So any infrastructure project just takes so long. So it's about getting more out of the existing grid. So how do we do that? One important lever here is software. And let's do that in three steps for this presentation. First one, you want to get more out of your existing assets. So that means caring about technical losses. So if we reduced one percentage point of technical losses throughout all European grids, we would save 10 medium-sized power plants. It's as much as that. So one percentage point would really matter. And with the power of software, if you actually use the real consumption profiles of your, uh, of your households and of your consumers, you can actually look for the places where those technical losses occur and you can reduce that one percentage point just because you use real data instead of assumptions. Getting more capacity out of existing assets, I think we talked about that also in the earlier panel. I mean, how much buffer, especially in the distribution grids, do we still have? And how much closer to the limits could we run those grids would we know what was going on there? Would we know what is at every second happening at each uh, transformer? So that's first step in cr using the potential of software to reduce transmission losses, to uh, reduce distribution losses, and also to um, get more out of the existing infrastructure and run it to closer to their limits. Next level gain more capacity through flexibility. And again, this is by the means of software. If you can manage your grid and you know in exactly which parts, when and where you have shortages, you can actually look for when and where there's capacity for flexibility and yet then you can match make the two non-wired alternatives speaks for themselves. It's not about hardware, it's about software and it's about smartly using that flexibility based on the transparency, knowing what's going on in your grid. And then thirdly, once you've squeezed out those two first steps out of your grid, then where would you invest any additional euro to do, the, to do any reinforcement and any capex extension? So if you can really tell where your grids are most loaded on real data, not on, not on assumptions, you can actually also give proof points that any tariff scheme or anything that, uh, that you're investing is invested on the right spot at the right time. So just uh, with a little bit of a funny picture showing what we can do and making the point that with the means of software or if you like with the means of digital, we can be so much faster in squeezing capacity out of the, the existing grid while we take the permissions, while we uh, make the plans for building new grids because of course that is needed as well. Now, some of you might say, huh, my last software project wasn't actually quite as fast. So uh, if you think about an ADMS project or something, mm, it takes you uh, two years to do the RFP to tender, to do whatnot, and then you implement, and uh, it wasn't as easy as that. OK, I give you that point. So how do we do that better? Because we all know software can be fast. So we argue that 
a truly modular approach, going away from those gigantic monolithic systems that extend from ADMS to DERMS and uh, through the world, is the faster way. So every module, whatever step you take, must deliver value immediately. And it needs to go across in the thinking, IT and OT, I think that by now in this audience goes for itself, um, but also across planning, operations, and maintenance. Because only if you think that together, and if you think how to optimize the business processes of managing and running your grid in an optimal way, can you gain that speed that is the promise that software holds for you. And you see our design principles on the right-hand side. It's interoperability, so no vendor lock-in. It's flexibility to adjust to some local legislation that you can't go without. And it's openness to really get to that, uh, maybe still dream well today, but plug and play and really connect in a very fast way. And I think the panel before us has talked about cybersecurity, so that w goes without saying. But the starting point for most DSOs, the legacy is different. Everybody has built for different reasons in different formats in different orders. The to-be place and the target picture for an IT-OT landscape, I would argue, given that the challenges are roughly the same everywhere with connection requests, with renewables, with distributed assets, with stochastic patterns and so forth, the target picture for that IT and OT landscape, by and large, is similar, if not the same, for many. Okay. So that's the pitch that I want to make. And since we broke the news last week, I just want to give you a real fast a proof point that it can be done. So what we announced last week as Siemens is that we're launching a software called LV Insights. It's based on those design principles. And it helps you run and actively manage your low voltage grid. So there, where you need the capacity most and where it's managed the least. So it's really giving you that, enabling you to take that step change on managing your grid and increasing your capacity. And I leave the best to the end. I was talking about speed. So what do you think we mean with speed in that context? We gave the promise last week, and it holds true uh, today, of course, that we will get that up and running in a matter of weeks. So we're not talking months, we're talking weeks of getting a full low voltage grid model and to giving you the key into your hands to manage your low voltage grids actively. And that's what the promise of Siemens Accelerator is about. And with that, hopefully pr a proof point of Yes, software can be fast, and if we do it the right way. Thank you. Oh, well, you can stay there. I stay so, here? So, yes, sure. I do. So, Sabine, it, you made it very clear, actually, that uh, digitization is the key enabler, actually, to accelerate uh, electrification and also to efficiently manage the network. Uh, but we are still not there, actually, and uh, digitization should happen uh, yet. So if you, should, if you pick one, which is for you the, let's say, top priorities in terms of investment in digitization right now? I would actually not say that we're not yet there. If you look at uh, some DSOs that, uh, that are around, they're quite remarkable in what they do already. So um, I, I think there's a lot, a lot of good things happening already. Um, and if I would pick one thing not, then I wouldn't say digitalization is equal to smart meters, because that's the confusion that we have so many times. So for me, the digitalization means a way of supporting and redesigning business processes, so grid operations, grid planning, and uh, grid maintenance, in a much smarter way, given the overload and given the inundation or the avalanche of DERs. 
Okay, thank you. So let me invite uh, the other speakers on, the, on stage. Uh, Balburga Emetsberger, CEO of Solar Power Europe. Mechtil Worsdorfer, Energy Deputy Director General for European Commission. Oliver hey. Franz, Vice President of the European Association at EON. And Emma Wisner, member of the European Parliament. So first of all, let's uh, get out some couple of polling questions for, for all the audience in order to, uh, to have your, let's say, uh, your view on this topic. Okay, so I see some phone. Okay, so from first one, from a customer point of view, what is the major bottleneck you see with regard to grid integration? And in the meantime, I will ask the panel to see it. And uh, which, which one do you pick for you? Oh, you answer on the phone. <laughs> so you can be the first one if you want. Do you have mic for everyone? Sorry. So good afternoon, everybody. Very nice to be here. This is the only male discussant. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't had that in the energy industry ever. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are making progress, very happy about that. Um, so for my kind of money and also from, from the discussions that we have inter alia uh, with Solar Power Europe in, in the last three months, uh, it's clearly connection delays and lack of transparency, visibility in the connection procedure. So uh, the consumer, quite frankly, is, is in the dark to a certain extent. Um, I'm German, so we have like 800 DSOs, as it is famously known, so the process is a bit different wherever you go. So if you're a professional actor, that's also an obstacle. So for me, it's clearly the first one. I think it depends what type of, of customer. I mean, if you're a small villa owner or a house owner, I would definitely say the connection delays and the big uncertainties regarding when you can connect your solar panels, for example. But if you're a major industry or data center or large scale industry consumer, it's definitely the lack, lack of visibility of, of grid data. Consumers don't know where they can connect and, and where in the grid uh, the most optimal localization would be. It's all apl application only, or application then comes information, um, which the Commission is now proposed to change, which I very much welcome. Okay, thank you. Mechthin, what, what thank is your... Thank you, I think it will start to be repetitive. <laughs> uh, okay. I would tend to agree the first one, connection delays and lack of transparency, and there is a certain lack of capacity, uh, lack of visibility on grid data. So that would be my order as well. Indeed, following very much what Emma said, depending on what you define as customer, customer. Uh, the homeowner will, will be you know, not so amused about the delays and uh, making it very difficult. But lack of visibility on grid data is something that we indeed identified as one of the key bottlenecks. Yeah. Agreed. But the Commission uh, has already proposed some, uh, <laughs> some measures against it, which is really great. <laughs> Sabine, you picked that. I, I could only repeat because yes. one is building on the other. If you don't have the visibility on the grid data, you can't make the connection procedures easier um, and you can't uh, increase the grid capacity either. So, so that are the keys, actually. Can you show the results, actually, for, for the audience? Okay, so I think that is, that is one. So the next one, what is, what is the most pressing investment category you think we need to boost the grid? We know Sabine's point of view, probably, but... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you want, do you want uh, to be the first? I mean, you are missing the mic. Uh, look, maybe I frame it in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, I think uh, as long as we have in the network codes an advantage for hardware investment and a disadvantage for software investment, we're not level playing field. So um, if we can fix that uh, very fast, then uh, the best investment wins, um, whether it's hardware or software. And I think given that we had the disadvantage on the software side for so long, there's uh, quite a big catch up uh, on the digital side to be made. 
in all of them are obviously important, but if I would need to pick one, uh, I would like to to highlight the need for flexibility. Yeah. I very much liked your toothpaste <laughs> example, uh, where you indeed said, you know, you need to squeeze out everything uh, before you do some capex investments. So flexibility still is something which is very much missing. I agree. I agree as well. Yeah. Flexibility <laughs> combined probably with the digitalization of the grid, because that's what we heard, we need to be more efficient with the existing grid, but we also make, need to make them smarter or digitalizing them, so. I miss one category, oh. uh, and that is also reinvestments in the existing grid. Yes. Uh, I'm from, from Sweden, and looking at the age structure of our grid, uh, it's really evident that we expanded the grid, uh, heavily building a lot of hydro hydropower first, and then a lot of nuclear in the 80s. Uh, but there's a clear lack of investment since, and now we have an age structure where we both need to do a lot of reinvestments, but also expanding and boosting the grid. And especially from, from the Nanor point of view, uh, we have done a lot of, of studies on how to boost production and the need of boosting production, but I think there's a clear lack in also assessments boosting the grid uh, in order to be able to hand that. So I would actually pick the one, create more grid. So reinvestments, which is not an option, <laughs> a reinvestment and creating more, because if we're going to do the industrialization and electrification, we need definitely more, more capacity in the grid. So actually, in, in, in the your electric study, I mean, they, they actually it's underline that the grid will be around 30, between 30 and 40 years old yeah. uh, into 2030. So that will be actually a, a real issue. Oliver. So I'm very happy that Emma is here because I would have picked the hardware part as well. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that we had that much of a disadvantage on software, really. We had the disadvantage on OPEX, and, and that still exists. And I, that is yeah. a question of time delay, and we need to work on that. Um, just to give you an idea, if you look at the, the connecting the dots study we did two years ago already, the, the, the lower threshold of investment is like 300 billion euros, and that doesn't include Repower EU and it doesn't include Red3. Uh, and we're of course trying to come up with a new number, and that number already included, and now please don't ask me how they calculated that, but it already included effects of digitization and flexibility. Oh. So um, yeah, there is definitely the need to increase the hardware, and if I may give you one prime example of that, if you want to electrify heavy duty vehicles, we talk megawatt charges. And there is no toothpaste that I can press on that. I just need to build new stuff. Great. So can we see also the result from the audience to see how they are aligned with uh, your, I mean, on average? Yeah, so flexibility is the key. And of course, digitization, we understand, is, is key enabler for, for flexibility itself. So let's come back to the Euroelectric study. And uh, the study underlines very clearly that for each euro invested in clean energy, we do need to invest half of this into the grid. So if this is true, how do you think we can manage this uh, at, at the speed we need, actually? Let's start uh, with, uh, with Balburga, if you want. Yeah. Um, very happy to. So first of all, it's great to have a study who, which is really, uh, you know, looking at what it needs in terms of uh, money investments. So uh, very good. So wha what from our perspective is the, is the starting point of everything is good planning. Uh, in the end, uh, we need to, and, and I very much like what you said, uh, the transition is happening so much faster than uh, we all have thought. And, you know, I'm just citing our own forecast that we do every year, uh, which, you know, people used to smile at us when we we're coming up this, uh, with the huge numbers. But uh, we've been outperforming our own forecast every <laughs> single year. year yeah. And again, last year, so when we installed more than 40 gigawatt. So, you know, there needs to be some more, um, you know, looking at what's really happening on the ground uh, when it comes to, to grid planning. So that's, that's the start of it. And then, you know, I was picking flexibility because I do think this is, you know, or let, let me put it differently, because um, you also have a point. You know, there's two pathways, basically, that we need to follow in parallel. So there's this long, winding road uh, of grid expansion, which needs to happen, no question. Uh, but then there's also shortcuts that we can take. Uh, and these shortcuts have to do a lot with flexibility. 
it is great that the European Commission in the market design proposal has been, you know, setting out the need for assessing flexibility, but clearly the next step needs to be implementing it and really using the assessment to do something with it, incentivize grid operators as well to do something with it uh, and build it in uh, and incentivize op OPEX investments in the end. Question, yes. Maybe I, I would add to that that definitely we need the regulatory framework and I think we can be rather proud that the Renewables Directive finally got adopted. Uh, it has to go through Parliament, but in, in, in the Council with 42.5 e, uh, renewables by 2030. The current WET2, which was adopted in 2019, had 32.5. So we are stepping up 10 percentage point uh, for the next coming six, seven years on renewables with a binding target and even a top up to 45. So we see a huge development already happening, but also we give a predictability towards 2030 and then let's not yet look at 2040, but uh, I think that is rather unprecedented because with the renewables we need more grids. I mean, we need efficiency and all that, but if we continue that space, and I think we need to really speed up, we need the planning, I fully agree, and then we need also to look, permitting is something we have also in RED3 uh, for renewables, but also related grids, so we want to accelerate uh, the permitting also for grids, and I think then at the end the financing, which is basically private, private investments, because we have our 10E regulation, connecting your facility, but that is for interconnectors between two countries or member states. What we need much more to focus on is not only transmission, but also distribution grids. And I think that's why we need a bit of a global, yeah. a broader picture here. She mentioned the parliament, so what is your view on that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, well, th thanks, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me also to this uh, discussion, giving a little bit of a parliament uh, uh, point of view. But I think, um, in general, I mean, the, the grids is a little bit like the, the um, hidden hero uh, of the green transition. I mean, the grids is not always center of attention. It's a lot about focus on production, um, but the grids will for sure be in the center. And looking at, and it's hard to, to see uh, in front of you now when we are very high electricity prices, but with integration of more renewable, renewables, production costs will go down. Uh, and we will be in a, a position where uh, the energy bill, what will be the driving force or what consumer will see is not actually high prices for production, but rather high costs of the grid. And we need to put more resources into grid uh, planning and also uh, flexibility management and a lot of services related to the grid rather than expensive energy production. So it will be a shift uh, in, in, in for the consumers, whether they want it or not. And we should also shift then also the political discussion based on that, putting grids a little bit more in the center of attention. I think that's what we can do from a political point of view, trying to highlight this more often. And I mean, for me, that would be uh, indeed work more with the 10E, I mean, double the budget for 10E, but that doesn't target the distribution, but it is indeed a transmission, uh, transmission grid, uh, but at least showing that uh, grid is a valuable asset that we are prioritizing. We could increase the interconnectivity targets even further, show that uh, once again, the transmission grids in between the member states are important. But then we're talking about the distribution grids, still talking about permitting and pushing on that, uh, but also, as the Commission have done, this anticipatory um, investment. investment, enabling that, and also visualizing the grid and showing uh, consumers and potential industries where they can uh, localize and be more transparent with grid capacity. That's also something that will help putting more political uh, attention and, and spotlight on the grids. Yeah, I think I mean, we will realize that actually the, the grid was taken a little bit for granted in the past. So now we are realizing that is not the case anymore, I think, uh, at least for the DSO perspective. And so we need really to make a difference and modernize it. And, uh, and this must be done both from a technical perspective or digitization perspective and both from the regu regulatory one. What is your view, Oliver? So thank you for, for bringing me in on that. So I could probably <laughs> react to, to each and everything that was said uh, by, by giving a half an hour <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 remark on that uh, because I've been a regulatory manager all my life. Um, 
just a few thoughts. Uh, I'll start with the anticipatory investment. We like the idea. We really like the idea, and we're thankful for the idea too. Um, but we need to maybe agree on one thing at the outset. If, if you take the word for what it means in Latin, it really means acting before the fact, meaning we will have a major, not major, but increased insecurity compared to following the demand. And that means we must somehow when make a mistake. And we need to clarify, especially if we want to bring in the private money, which I totally agree upon too, um, what then to do about those mistakes. Uh, surely they can't be all on us, surely they can't be all on the consumer, but we have to find a way to do that. Uh, and, and for the, this thing to really become, uh, how should I say, as powerful as it possibly can be, I'm also very thankful uh, for Mechtet mentioning the permitting times, because you, the problem in low voltage is not that I can't build. That's a resource problem. I need the men to be there and the women, of course. And maybe I need a transformer and might, I might have a procurement problem right now. Uh, but I, I have to talk to the mayor's office and then I can do that. In high voltage, to give you an idea, it takes you seven to 10 years from the moment you start to realize that you will need an additional line to the moment you actually are able to transport electricity on that. And of course, I the faster we, or the wh while we accelerate everything else and we don't accelerate that, then, then we're gonna be stuck. So um, ha totally happy with everything that was said, but we have to talk about <laughs> some details, I guess. Um, and, and maybe one, one final, um, I was surprised that, that uh, the, the Bundesnetzagentur actually went on that panel because we had a panel in Berlin the other week uh, that was called in German, Schaffen wir die Regulierungswende, which would translate to, are we able to get to a regulatory transition? Uh, and I really believe that there is some truth to that, and why? Because if you look at all the literature that this regulation on incentive is based upon, it's also implicitly assuming that the grid is stable. It's not growing. And now we need to grow it very fast, and that means that regulation will have to change. I'm not saying take any kind of efficiency con consideration away. What I'm saying is embrace and accommodate the growth that there will be going on. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think that flexibility is a topic that has become more and more, uh, even in this very first part of the discussion. So let's go a little bit deeper into the flexibility, both from uh, a regulatory perspective, as, as you're saying, that perhaps we need some more innovation on, on some regulatory regime, at least at the national level, and from a technology perspective, because we see that still we are not there in terms of flexibility service and then to solve some congestion problem we have. Sabine, you will to yeah. start with the I think the flexibility topic, at least in the UAE, is EU is a hand and egg problem. Because I think we are ready to provide technology if we knew what we are providing it for. So I think the, if we get the regulatory framework clear, then I think we are very, very fast in then providing the right answer to that from a technology perspective. But what we are, from a technology provider perspective, perspective sitting and waiting a little bit and um, I think there has been enough precedence on if you look at Areti in Rome I mean there they successfully in a kind of uh, experiment let's say deploying it there's if you look at to the uh, UK if you look to the US there's enough places where we can look at how it can work so if we get those frameworks right I think we we are ready tomorrow, so or today, <laughs> if you like. So technology is ready. Emma, you want to spot on I the regulation side? No, but I really like what one of the previous speakers said, that the fuel of renewables is capital and uh, financial investments. And that's really true in a way. And I think we have a great political responsibility in making sure that that capital and those investments are, are taking place. In order to do so, you need clear market rules, clear regulations, so that industries investing knows what is the expected return of investment. I mean, we need to provide a certainty in the expected return of investment. Otherwise, those investments will not take place. And I think that's a big problem in many of the member states and in the EU in general, that the rules for flexibility have been very uh, unclear and very uncertain for a long time. And 
Uh, the, the, uh, the fourth energy market package provide a lot of instruments, but they're not yet implemented in all of the member states, and when they are, they also implement it differently. Um, so we provide more clarity there, and I think the Commission takes a lot of good first steps to that, um, but then we can even provide even more uh, certainty and, and uh, clarity. Going to the Commission, actually, and the, the new energy uh, market design actually spot actually how to uh, try to boost a bit flexibility and but leave at the member states, right, the regulation on that. Do you think this will happen or not? Yes, I do, because first of all, we need to agree on the new electricity market design with Council and Parliament, and hopefully later this year this will be adopted. But I think it's a really a first step, and obviously it can only go hand in hand with the member states, and I, I fully agree on the implementation what is already possible now, but then what will be possible with the market design. And nobody prevents the member states to anticipate that and already look into it now while we are adopting the, the, the new rules. So I guess it can only work hand in hand with the industry, obviously, but also with the member states. And they need to step up the implementation, clearly. I have one more wish. I okay. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I have one more wish, if I may. The, I think Typically you say, oh, don't regulate too much and leave some freedom to the <laughs> member states. But if we solve for speed, and I think if we are urgently solving for speed, we are also looking for scale, especially if we compare to the US, um, then consistency across Europe will help for speeding and for scaling and for getting the economies of scale, especially the technology that, uh, that you have. So that, that uh, would be my big wish, apart from uh, let's clarify, let's make it also as consistent as possible. Before going to the DSO, let's go from the generation. You are stuck in the middle, so let's... <laughs> Uh, I very much agree. You know, we also need to have the assets in the system. Uh, that's why which are providing flexibility. And there also, it's a little bit of a hand and egg problem. What we need, and you know, we just recently joined forces with our wind colleagues and then the storage colleagues, because what we need is to build up those assets as quickly as possible. Uh, and you know, the storage coalition that we have been uh, founding is very much showing how much flexibility uh, we need in the system. Um, now, it all has to do, because I think we're all aligned on the regulatory framework the, that it needs. In the end, it has to do with getting the right revenue uh, for flexibility and, and really being able to do some revenue stacking also with, uh, with the flexibility uh, assets we have. So I do think speed is incredibly important because this will help us to integrate renewables much faster that need, be, need to be built much faster. Uh, but then, you know, tapping into all kinds of flexibility. So not just, uh, you know, flexibility markets, but it's also about uh, flexibility when connecting to the grid. So we're very much asking for, uh, you know, firm uh, non-firm capacity agreements uh, with DSOs that you can uh, provide more capacity or build more capacity and then, you know, just see with the DSO what can be integrated, for example. So it's great that we are working uh, on those solutions. Um, and then implicit flexibility in terms of use tariffs, energy sharing. Uh, so we hope that, uh, you know, the, again, <laughs> the very good proposal of the European Commission uh, will be taken up in the final negotiation. So there's all kinds of flexibilities, but it needs to be clear. It needs to also have a revenue attached to the flexibility that it's taking up at the speed that we need it. Of course, yes, investment need to be covered. So, so you role. might be surprised to hear that from a German person, but I believe that the hang head and neck problem on flexibility I is really solved. If you go outside and look at the, the stand that my Swedish colleagues have been building, <laughs> which shows you the switch platform, then the only thing I can conjecture from that is if you have the smart meters in place and the data is there, people look at the data like you implied, they find out, oops, we could do things here, we could do things there, we don't have a, that much of a capacity problem there. So, um, again, as a German, that's hard to say, but you need the smart meters. <laughs> and they're probably like, like and, and Greenspan would probably call them like an insurance investment. So if you have them, you have data, you have observability, uh, and probably, yes, you have them at a few places. You don't need them exactly right now, but you probably need them next year, or maybe it's at the end of the line and you still have a use of the observation. Um, so mistake is always a hard word. 
but uh, I believe it, it is really dommage, the French would probably say, uh, that, that we are so late in the rollout in, in Europe, especially in Germany, because we would really need those things in order to harvest the data. And then, like you see outside, the, the flexibility platform ideas and all that, based on that, comes around more or less uh, automatically. And yes, like Valboga was implying, we, we had a very good roundtable, the last one, uh, together with your team. And, and this, the, the one thing we can absolutely agree upon, especially for larger PV plants, is probably to, to have the right between this customer and the DSO to have a discussion on how could we shape that connection in a way that it helps both parties but doesn't create that much of a burden on the otherwise ongoing grid calculation going forward. So, so whatever you want to call that, unfirm, flexible, uh, but th th there is value in there and we should try and grasp that value. Again, we will need systems to monitor what's going on. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Let me say that uh, as Italian for once I can be proud of our <laughs> smart metering, <laughs> let's say. Uh, so I will, ask, I will ask the audience if there is any question to ask to, to, uh, to the speakers. Uh, if not, I mean, let me you, you actually mentioned smart meters, and actually in 2022, still we have one out of two customers having smart meter. Of course, as we were saying, as Sabine was saying, this is not all the old things to do for digitizing the network, but you are correctly saying that having those data are key in order to really change, to change the market. So do you think, and this could be the last question to the panel, which could be actually the uh, uh, changes in regulation in order to really boost at European level the deployment of smart meter or digitization itself. Next one. Thank you. I think it's basically already in the EU legislation, so it's up to the member states. And there is the example of yeah. Italy and the example of Germany and other member states. So you can go ahead. It's already there, the regulatory framework, you can go ahead and there are very good examples. So I think what we need to do is probably promote more. We work a lot with exchange of best practices and all more we can do. And as I'm not sure I speak again, I will mention our high level GRIDS conference on the 7th of September, which we are organizing. The commissioner might have mentioned it here in Brussels and some of the topics we are discussing here, it's really to show, I mean, the importance of grids. As we all say, there's a lot of attention, rightly so, on, on deployment, on renewables targets, and I mean, I'm the first one to say that is absolutely necessary, but what we also need to do is to look more at grids, but transmission, distribution, I would even go further the, a bit in the system approach, what is needed there, and good ideas here, so we can continue that discussion at the latest. Emma, you want to add something? Um, yeah, because I mean, there's so many benefits with the smart meter. So I think we should also keep using it in regulation. So that the member states, I mean, do follow ups from the commission, of course, making sure that all member states implement the smart grid, uh, the smart metering systems, but also keep building regulation based on it. I mean, there are many things you can do when you have real time data of electricity sourcing and build a more modern energy system. So keep building regulation on that so that the member states are lagging behind are really uh, seeing the disadvantage of not being digitalized. And with those words, I have to run because I have a, I need to catch a train. Okay. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a flight to, uh, back to Sweden. So, so uh, thank the, you for the being taxi there. is waiting for me outside. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and let's close with the, uh, I mean, regulation is there. So what is your view on well, why it's so hard to I have smart meter deployment? If I may take that in a bit of a broader sense, not only focusing on smart meters, th there would be one request that we would really have, and that would be to, to have like, um, at least remind national governments and the NRAs of really looking through their system, identifying maybe obstacles that exist of historical decisions and abolishing those. So I believe if you, in any system you will find something that you can explain historically, but it is now in, in the way, and in Germany especially, sorry for saying it, but to liberalize the metering market and to try to have a smart meter roll, maybe if you wanted the rollout fast was well, not the best idea, so maybe you have to reconsider that, that decision at the outset. Uh, but, but really abolishing the obstacles that are clearly there, that would be uh, fantastic. And, and uh, I believe that then everybody can take up that discussion nationally, but we lead the clear 
let's say, hint from Brussels that there might be obstacles and that you should go search for them? Sabine, you are. Uh, just reinforcing what has been said. I mean, once you see all DSOs that have the data from the smart meters, I mean, the ideas of where you can use it, how it helps you, being a, bringing it transparency in your low voltage grid, making grid planning easier, um, finding capacities. It really is, it's an endless stream of examples that I could give you from use cases that have been realized um, and are being realized on, on the basis of smart meters. So it's, I think by now it's almost a no regret move um, and uh, a no brainer, if, as you call it, uh, to do it. So whoever uh, still needs justification, I think there's uh, tons more than just optimizing the billing process and gaining consumer efficiency, but it really is an asset for managing grids better. Okay, so with that, let me thank you all the panelists for the valuable insights and let's meet in September, right? <laughs> for, uh, for the grid on the European Commission. Thank you, thank you so much.